One. I have a story from a former friend of mine. We aren't friends anymore since he just got more toxic with time. And it likely stems from his mother, who was a real Princess Peach in her own right. Her husband died when her son was a teenager and she quickly remarried. My former friend did not like his new stepfather, and it was a mutual hate as the man had his own kids he moved into the house. Former friend turned 18, moved out and into an apartment above his grandparents' garage, and we met when we were both 20. We were co-workers that hit it off well. I was new to the area at the time, and he helped me figure the city out. For five years, he and I were like brothers. We knew everything about each other, but then he started to get demanding. And one day, he punched me for suggesting he get a mental health check. He refused to apologize, and we went our separate ways. I'm 30 now and haven't heard from him for a long time. His mom was a whole other can of vodka-soaked gummy worms, though. This woman was clearly narcissistic, and my former friend cried to me about her many times. She showed up at his apartment constantly, and she was always trying to volunteer him to do things. He told me that before he moved out, she would regularly tell friends and relatives that he would come over and do chores for them, and then force him to do it, either for free, or his mom would keep the money if he was paid anything. Eventually, his grandparents had to open up a checking account for him to deposit any money he earned into, so he'd have something to use when he became an adult. His mom lost her mind and demanded access to the account. She claimed that before she'd only been holding on to his money for him till he was of age. But they knew she spent it, because she never willingly returned a cent. His grandparents made her pay back $200, even though it was likely more than that. And she acted like they were robbing her, even though she'd basically been robbing her son for years. Fast forward to when he and I were best friends. I watched him get in several confrontations with his mother, and after a while he came up with something I thought was genius. He got a generic spray bottle filled with water and kept it in reach by the front door. When his mom would start yelling at him, when he talked to her while he stood outside, he squirt her in the face and tell her no, like a dog when she got belligerent. Thanks to help from his grandparents, he managed to afford a car. It was just an old minivan, but he treated it like his baby. His mom flipped her lid because she felt it was unsafe for him to have a car. She never helped him get his license. His grandparents had to do that. His mom never really had a good reason as to why she didn't want him to drive. But she nagged at him about it anyway. He told me the real reason she was so angry with him owning his own car meant that he could go far away and never come back if he wanted to. And she wanted to keep him under her thumb. Then his mom went from nagging about how he shouldn't be driving to needing him to share the van with his eldest step-sibling. The kid was 16 or so and had a permit hot off the press. Not a license, a permit. My former friend, understandably, didn't trust his kid and told his mom no. His stepbrother would not be driving his car. His mom showed up again with the whole step-family in tow and they gave my former friend a big speech about how he needed to help family. He told them he'd call the police if they even touched his van. The next day, he found both sides of his van had been keyed. The paint already sucked, but this didn't help. Fortunately, the apartment complex had a CCTV, and it showed his stepdad doing the deed. He was given the choice to either repaint the van, or my former friend would press charges. The man repainted the van himself. Wasn't great paint, but it was an improvement. The van went from patchy metallic green to white. The final thing that happened with former friend's mom before he and I stopped being friends was she attempted to force him to renounce any claim to his grandparents' will. His grandparents had become so fed up with their daughter's entitled narcissistic behavior that they said they changed their joint will to give everything to their grandson. He was elated by this, but his mother not so much. She had a meltdown about it, and he got threats from his stepdad. A former friend just told them that he'll take all the evidence of harassment to the police if they didn't leave him alone. And they finally did. They stopped talking to the former friend completely by the time we parted ways. So that's it. The only Karen story I have to tell. 2. Hello, I'm a junior in high school, currently on summer break, about to be a senior. This happened back in 2019 when I was in 6th grade summer break, going on to 7th grade. 
On that day, I was invited to a pool party for my dad's friend's daughter returning from vacation in Mexico with her grandmother. Well, the entitled daughter was just returning and wanted to go swimming. She just got a pool built in her backyard that looked identical to mine. Just hers had a hot top, ours did not. I expected to just go to the entitled mom's house because she lived next door. Turns out the party wasn't at her house. I assumed this meant we would be going to a friend's house in the neighborhood, but nope. We all hopped into the car to head to the public pool. I was cool with it. Thankfully, my mom gave me money for food, just in case the pool party wasn't at somebody's house. We get to the pool just for EM to expect us to pay for our own bracelets. I'm cool with it due to having my own money, but I was confused. I assumed since she invited us out, she was paying for us. I pay for my ticket, but I turn to see my friends, Esmeralda and Ashley. Esmeralda is the younger one of the sisters, close to the entitled daughter's age, and the older sister, Ashley, is about my age. They both didn't bring any money because we thought we were swimming at somebody's house and not a public pool. EM started scolding them, and paid, mumbling about how their mom owes them now. Isabella, the youngest there, paid for herself because her family had given her money. Leslie, Edie's older cousin by three years, was paid for only because he's family, and his mom was sending money to his aunt when he stayed there. So we finally get in and I'm really hungry, and decided I was going to eat first because I skipped breakfast, I think. I got a lot of food due to my mom giving me $20. From what I remember, I got a hot dog, some chips, ice cream, and a slushie. I understand how crazy it was that I ate that, but I had some issues at the time at home. To sum it up, because I don't feel like getting too into it, basically, I ate whatever I wanted when I wasn't home because my family was controlling over food. I also had health issues that made me eat more, plus medication. Anyways, EM looked at me in disgust and said, You shouldn't eat all that because... And she wandered off. I knew what she was trying to say, but she remembered that my dad is friends with her fiancé, and if she said what she was planning to say, it could cause issues. So she remembered something that she thought would work. She said, Your mom wouldn't be okay with you eating all that. I responded, but I don't recall what it was I told her. I got into the pool after eating and played in the water for a bit. Every time I lightly splashed my friend Ashley, or the entitled daughter, EM would get mad and yell at me and Ashley because we were the oldest and should act our age. We were also then expected to watch the little kids and follow them around. Me and Ashley didn't want to, but did so because it got embarrassing being stared at by everyone when EM would yell at us. Me and Ashley barely got to do what we wanted in the pool. Mind you, me and Ashley were in 6th and 7th grade, watching a 4th grader and 3rd grader and a 2nd grader, instead of enjoying the pool. If me and Ashley knew we were going to be used as unpaid babysitters, we would have stayed at home and swam at my house. The kids got out of the pool because they got hungry, so we followed, and I wanted a popsicle because it hit 103 at that time. When we first got to the pool, it was about 95. EM side-eyed me and said, you don't need any more food because you ate four hours ago. We were at this pool for about nine hours in total. I said, I know, but I just want a popsicle. So she allowed me to take my coin purse back and buy one. At first she said I have to give the other kids the rest of the money so they can eat. I lied and said popsicles were two dollars and I only have two left. She got upset and scolded me saying I shouldn't have gotten all that food and now the others wouldn't get to eat. I brought my own money and so did Isabella. EM pulled out five dollars and told them to share, but when Isabella refused the money, saying she had her own, EM asked how much she had, and she said she had thirty or forty dollars, but her mom said it's only for her and to return the rest to her mom. EM took back her five and said Isabella has to pay for all the kids because she has the most money, and her mom would be fine with it. Also, EM never paid back Isabella's mom. The kids cost her thirty dollars. I got a popsicle and I bought the last Sour Patch Kids, which was for my older brother, because he was super nice to me that week. I enjoyed two popsicles and placed the candy in my bag secretly, because I didn't want to let the other kids see them. EM shamed Jack, Isabella, entitled Daughter, and Esmeralda for what they got. I shared with Ashley some of my food because we were super close. EM was mad that I didn't share with her daughter. We went swimming again afterwards and came back a few hours later to EM complaining about random stuff then wanting to leave. 
So we packed up our stuff, and Ashley was complaining about hunger to me, quietly, to not be scolded by EM for not making Isabella pay for her meal. So I gave her a few Sour Patch Kids because I accidentally opened the box when I grabbed my clothes. I put the box back quietly, and then I turned to EM, who was shaming me for buying candy and not sharing with the other kids. She then says, OP, you need to share with the other kids because you ate enough today. When the other kids heard I had candy, they all ran up begging for candy. When I tried to explain to the EM the candy is mainly for my brother, she accused me of lying and said I had to share. The kids ran to my bag, excited for candy, and EM took the candy from my bag and shared it between all the kids. After giving the kids handfuls of candy, she gave me and Ashley three pieces each for being greedy. The only thing that kept me looking forward to this day was going to pick up ice cream at an ice cream shop. As soon as we got close enough, EM said we don't deserve ice cream, and said we will get some at her house. As soon as we got there, we got many otter pops. Ashley declined because she wanted ice cream, and went home to get some from her house. Everyone else, shockingly enough, including me, got an otter pop. Only half, though, because we didn't deserve a full otter pop. There were also many otter pops. I went home disappointed, but didn't tell my parents for fear of getting in trouble for the food I ate. Three. Okay, this event took place before the pandemic. I had worked at this job six years before I finally left its toxic environment. Yet I got along with just about all my co-workers. I also, won't lie, live with my mom, which I will only say this because of a couple of things. My stepdad passed away from lung cancer in 2018, having passed seven months after he was diagnosed. In 2019, she and I got the house we currently live in. Now, when this event took place, I worked nights at my job at the time. I would normally be home around 6am due to not driving at the time. It was too cold for me to use my e-bike, so I would get rides from co-workers or bike depending on the weather. This is also Canada, so it can get cold. My asthma makes it hard to bike in cold weather. This was my day off, so I was hoping to just relax and just sleep. Though that wasn't meant to happen, it seemed, as I was woken up by some sound above me. I live in the basement at my house, as it's a finished basement, and my bedroom is under the living room of the house. But I chalked it up to mom watching some TV, so I get out of bed and go to grab my mom's bedding that was in the dryer. As I was getting up the stairs and open the door, that was when I see the dog. Another thing I should point out, the dog Buddy was my stepdad's dog, who, as he would call, Buddy was his furry son. This dog kept my mom sane when my stepdad passed away and was always comforted by this dog and everything that came later into her life. We had Buddy three years after my stepdad passed before he was diagnosed with lung cancer like my stepdad. We still miss this dog. Ah, it was strange for me to see him in the kitchen. Basement door leads into the kitchen instead of living room or my mom's room. He was practically glued to my mom's side, so I asked, What are you doing here, buddy? He was just wagging his tail at me, so I go toward the living room door and saw that the door was shut. Again, that confuses me, so I just mentally shrug and open the door. Hey, mom, I'm bringing up your... I stopped when I see a very familiar face on the couch with my mom. Oh, OP, this is... I know who he is, mom, I said. It wasn't clicking for me what was going on, because again... I just woke up from doing a close and didn't really get a hell of a lot of sleep. How do you know him, she asked. The guy's eyes were wide since I walked into the living room. I work with his wife. Mom is in confusion and kind of leans back a little looking at the man, asking, your ex-wife? She seemed a little skeptical. Before he could even answer, I said, no, his current wife, and I mentioned her name. Mom, of course, is in shock, and again, I don't clue in as to what was going on. Just talking as I walk further into the living room with her bedding and set it on a chair. I pet Buddy and make sure he goes outside to do his thing, and then I go back to my living room in the basement. The guy was kicked out a while later, though. Beforehand, he had begged my mom to tell me not to tell his wife about this, because she's possessive. So for months, I kept my mouth shut. Though that wasn't the only thing she told me. 
She had told me that the reason why Buddy was kept out of the living room was because the moment this guy Jay walked into the house, Buddy actually growled at him. This dog, who loves everyone he meets, growled at someone. That alone shocked me when my mom told me this. Well, that and it turns out that Jay also knew my mom's cousin and her cousin's husband. They went to high school together. I only found that out when Mom mentioned that was part of their conversation before I came up the stairs. When Mom also told me that he was there because they met on Tinder and that this was a date, oh how I wished that I knew sooner. I would have kicked his butt out the door myself. Because if there was one thing I hated, it was cheaters. My mom had been cheated on before and she hates them, so she was thankful that I came up when I did. There is still more to this story. As I said, I had kept my mouth shut for months of not telling my co-worker. Well, months after this date happened, I was working with her. As we worked, I heard her saying that she was being kicked out of her townhouse. I was confused and asked what happened. She told some of us that her husband tried to overdose, and she had managed to get help in time to save him, so she had pretty much saved his life. Yet how does he repay her? by trying to get her kicked out of the house. So when I heard that, I'm just like, screw this, no repercussions. Then I told her everything that happened, how he met my mom, to him being at my house, to when I came up, everything. When I was done, she just stared at me. A mix of shock as well as, well, I'm not really sure what this other look was, but she looked like this had happened before, which she confirmed. Turns out Jay cheated on her throughout their entire marriage. They have five kids, her oldest is at least 20s or 30s, I don't remember. Also, he was the possessive one, not her. Whenever they separated, he was always allowed to see other people, but not her, and made damn sure of that. Once she had everything I told her, she had finally been pushed because, with what I told her, it seems that it was far worse than what he has done in the past. Their marriage was just toxic, from what I learned later on. Not just with destroying her property, such as her phone, but he hacked into her Facebook to make posts. I don't know all the details, but what I do know is that there is now a restraining order against him. He even tried to tear her down by saying that no man would want her because she was used and old. Mind you, she isn't old, she's still young and has lots of life in her. Then told her that she's too old to get a union job, but she proved him wrong on all accounts. Got herself a good man, got a good paying job, and she even lost weight. Hell, she's doing a good job of living her life right now, but there was one thing that I had asked her, after I had told her everything. You said I look just like my mom, right? I had asked. She said, yes, you do. I had posted pics of me with my mom on Facebook for my mom's 50th birthday, and my co-worker had commented on just how much my mom and I look alike. I'm her clone, to say the least. Her husband had met me many times in the past because he would sometimes bring her coffee or bring her her debit card that she forgot. So how is it that your husband didn't even notice how much I looked like my mom when he met her? I asked. Her words, I can't help but smile at the thought of such a thing. Because he's an idiot! I laughed a little at that. Even their son, who also worked with us, told me that his dad isn't that smart. So, you can tell that it had to be true of his own wife, now ex-wife and son, tell me the same thing. When I'd even told her how he knew my mom's cousin and her husband, she told me that it was most likely that he would have tried to get lucky with her as well. Though that wasn't going to happen anyway, because my mom's cousin is still very much in love with her husband, high school sweethearts. So, this guy tried to get lucky, only for it to ruin his marriage. Karma at its finest. But I still wished I had said something to her sooner, I won't lie. That is my only regret with this, but I'm at least happy that she got out of that toxic marriage, now living her best life without that idiot. 4. I was in the hospital and ended up being put in the observation unit because no specialist beds were available. The OBS unit is a catch-all ward where patients are put if they're not in imminent danger but need regular monitoring. It's bright and extremely noisy, so nobody can sleep well. Unfortunately, Biscuit Karen arrives at 10pm on day one. Why is she called Biscuit Karen? 
because she wants a biscuit, and she's shouting this loudly enough for the whole OBS unit to hear. Never mind the time, or that we're mostly trying to sleep. Never mind that her blood sugar is 8.5 elevated and she's diabetic, so she really doesn't need more sugar. But hey-ho, the long-suffering nurses find her a biscuit and ask her to be quiet. Biscuit Karen does not quieten down because shouting is her default setting, and she doesn't seem to notice that other patients exist. After ten minutes of solid noise pollution, she wants another biscuit. The nurses give it to her. More noise, then another fifteen minutes later, she shout calls for another biscuit. The nurses are occupied, so nobody answers her immediately. So she shouts her request louder, as if we all hadn't heard her already. This is where the nurses begin to lose patience. She is told to be quiet, and her blood sugar level is mentioned. However, because Karen insists, she's given another biscuit. Maybe the nurses drug this one, because Biscuit Karen soon goes to sleep and snores. Loudly. This was a taste of what was to come, but nobody on the OBS unit knew it yet. Day 2, 11pm. Biscuit Karen has been okay all day, and nothing much appears to be wrong with her. She has a walking aid and can get herself to the toilet, but she doesn't want to. She shout calls to a nurse to put her on the commode. A very blunt nurse points out that she's seen Karen walking, so she's not going to help her. The toilet is only ten meters away. Biscuit Karen does not accept this. She keeps shouting for a nurse to help her. Eventually, the blunt nurse goes to check, and Biscuit Karen has actually wet herself in her passive-aggressive rage. The nurse is shocked and is telling Biscuit Karen off. She does not care. Meanwhile, the bed is now sodden and the sheets have to be changed. The blunt nurse helps put Biscuit Karen on the commode and then goes to get the spare sheets. Unfortunately for the nurses, other patients are being equally tricky. There's an alcoholic man who can't walk but keeps trying and falling to the floor. The polar opposite of our anti-heroine. And a woman with the broken neck who constantly takes off her nightgown and tries to go wandering. All the nurses are busy rounding up the strays and inevitably forget about the abandoned Biscuit Karen left sitting on the commode. But she ensures that she's not neglected for long. Can somebody help me? Ricochets repeatedly around the OBS unit to the dismay of all the people trying to sleep. Eventually it becomes, Somebody help me, my back hurts! Of all the disruptive behavior happening on the OBS unit, she's by far the loudest, the most persistent and the most obnoxious. Because she caused her own discomfort in the first place. I'm peeved and so is everyone else. Blunt nurse gets back to her and an argument starts. She's cross as she's needlessly making the bad. Biscuit Karen is angry that she's been left in an uncomfortable sitting position. In fact, she's getting more aggressive by the second and eventually she slaps the nurse. Blunt nurse doesn't put up with this nonsense. She abandons making the bed, leaves Biscuit Karen on timeout, still on the commode, and ignores all shouted demands to come back. She tells the other irate patients that she's not risking further aggression, and we all agree with her in solidarity. Blunt Nurse was true to her word, so eventually, deeply compassionate Nurse tried her luck making the bed. Unfortunately, for DC Nurse, Biscuit Karen is a raging racist, true to the stereotype, and she not only calls her the N-word, but also tells her to go back to where she came from. DC Nurse nopes out at that point whilst Blunt Nurse calls security. Biscuit Karen has begun yelling every few seconds. I want my phone! Where's my phone? Bill from the commode. Presumably so she can enact her threats. I'm going to report you! I'm going to get you fired! The nurses aren't stupid, though, so nobody gives Biscuit Karen her phone. It doesn't occur to her to get off the commode and find her own phone. Meanwhile, the other patients have hit their bull saturation point and have started yelling at her to shut up. It's past 12 a.m. and nobody can go to sleep yet. At this point, the cries from her change to Somebody help me! Every three seconds over and over again. The nurses are unmoved. There is a torrent of reactive verbal abuse from the other patients. But she doesn't seem to hear them. In fact, she has completely developed into a pathetic toddler tantrum. Except toddlers have more self-respect. And she stays immersed in her self-pity for a long time. Meanwhile, 1 a.m. rolls around. Security officers take their time to arrive, but when they do, 
they are met with what appears to be a distressed old lady who claims that the nurses are hurting her, and the DC nurse actually hit her, an audacious lie. However, Biscuit Karen is too dysregulated to keep up the facade for long, and morphs back into a spiteful and aggressive harpy when Blunt Nurse goes back to fix the bed. The security officers see exactly why they were called and try to keep the peace whilst the bed is finally finished. There's not much two thick-set men can do with a small old woman perched on a commode, but they tried. Eventually, she starts demanding her medication and somebody comes up with the bright idea of calling an accident and emergency doctor. Who can quell the entitled savagery of the enraged Karen? Of course, it would be a young, handsome, confident male doctor. The very epitome of a rescuer to an old twister who's trying to play the victim. When he turns up, Biscuit Karen becomes a sweet and compliant old lady, answering, Yes, doctor. No, doctor. She does try to repeat her lie about being assaulted, but several patient statements, two jaded nurses, and two exiting security personnel proved otherwise. The doctor gave her her meds, she was helped to bed, and she fell asleep. Meanwhile, the rest of the patients on the OBS unit were too high on adrenaline to feel drowsy so we were condemned to further wakefulness. I was glad to leave the next day. Five, so this isn't my story, but my bestie's, and I got her permission to post. My bestie is a 26-year-old woman, and her husband is a 27-year-old man. They live with her husband's parents and younger brother-in-law in his early 20s, and his girlfriend's sister-in-law in her early 20s. And it's just a full circus there. For some context and what kind of person my bestie is, she grew up with almost nothing. She and her husband are both the eldest children. Now she is caring, bubbly, has this childlike innocence, emphatic, and really, really, really hardworking. She is the hardest worker I've ever met. Of all the 11 years we've been friends, I've seen her go from couch surfing while doing side jobs just to get by, to getting her bachelor's degree and having a full-time good-paying job. Both she and her husband have full-time jobs, when they had my goddaughter. And she makes more than her husband, too. Still both full-time workers. Now here's the issue with the in-laws. They aren't married yet. They were supposed to have a courthouse wedding when she got pregnant, but things didn't work well. But they are getting married soon. My friend had contributed a lot to the household. She got an AC unit for them she cleans. She and her husband, if I recall correctly, help pay father-in-law's motorcycle that neither could even use. She helps pay for the electricity, water, and Wi-Fi. She rarely eats there, too. She and her husband usually eat at her parents' house. The sister-in-law is a piece of work, same with the brother-in-law. Neither work, and they don't even contribute anything to the household. It got to the point where my friend noticed their toiletries were running out quickly. And that's when they realize that sister-in-law and brother-in-law use their stuff. This resulted in putting their groceries in the bedroom because, you know, they pay for their groceries. Sister-in-law and brother-in-law also have a daughter who is a year or two younger than my goddaughter. And boy, this lady. She would post photos of her daughter online begging for money. She doesn't work, and yet she has the time to leave her own kid alone in their bedroom without telling anyone. She has no money for the child's needs and lets her parents and in-laws pay for the baby's needs, but has the money to get a tattoo. I have nothing against tattoos, I also want to get one. But come on, get your tats after you've taken care of your kid's needs. She also has an older daughter from her first boyfriend. She got pregnant at 16, and why? Because she wanted a baby to trap her boyfriend because we've been together for a few years now. And said baby daddy left her. Now, what upset my friend this time? Well, it turns out, mother-in-law, just like any other grandparent, is giving her grandkids some cookies. Well, she gave my goddaughter a cookie that apparently belongs to sister-in-law's daughter. And sister-in-law was complaining and asked why my friend isn't buying cookies for her goddaughter. Now, my friend was not the one who took the cookie and gave it to the child. It was mother-in-law. And another thing, she doesn't like cookies. She does like soup, though. I've seen her finish two small bowls of soup before. My friend bought her cookies before and she never ate them. Her husband was the one who ended up eating them. It really ticked my friend off. I mean, I definitely understand. She wasn't the one who gave a treat to her daughter. And how selfish do you have to be to complain about a piece of cookie that was given to a toddler? 
Sister-in-law also made some snark remarks about my friend, looking down on her, when her and her husband work hard for their daughter. They give her everything that they never got to have as children within reason. They don't leave her alone without actual supervision. They follow what the pediatrician tells them to. She's a healthy toddler. She's happy and boy the way she smiles when seeing her mommy and daddy is just precious. She hates being away from them, no joke. My friend walked me out to the house to my vehicle, and she ran after her crying, thinking that we were leaving without her. That's how attached she is to her parents. She can sleep on them without worry, she's just excited to be with them. With the sister-in-law and her daughter, it's a polar opposite. She screams at the toddler, threatening to beat the kid. Mother-in-law even scolded sister-in-law for starting a fight with a toddler. Yes, imagine being an adult, but you can't handle your kid being a kid. Me who is childless is more concerned for her child than her. I don't get why she can just leave her kid alone in a room without telling anyone. What if there was a fire? What if she falls off the bed? What if she hits her head? Children, especially toddlers, are accident prone. If you're not worried about your kid, what kind of parent are you? She has no job, she doesn't do anything but gossip with the neighbors, and yet, she cannot find the time to take care of her own kid. And she still makes my friend look like the bad mom. I do hope karma hits her soon, because if not, I might actually fight someone half a decade or so younger than me. There's a lot more about this sister-in-law, but that will take me a whole week to write down. Now, you might be thinking of suggesting that they're adults, they should just move out. Well, first of all, we're not in the US, we live in an Asian country. And just because they have full-time jobs, that doesn't mean they can move out. They've tried moving out, they have the means to. But honestly, you don't know which country we live in, and our culture. Her in-laws are a huge help. They take care of my goddaughter when they're out to work. And no, babysitters are not a thing here. Our culture trusts family members. Heck, my neighbors, who are two lovely elderly people, have all their adult kids who have successful jobs and live with them. It's our culture. T's in-laws are good people. It's the sister-in-law who came along and acted like she owned the house. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Idiots in the Wild, episode 169. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, hit the like button and share the video with friends and family. And if you'd like early access to these videos, that's easy enough to do. Just support me on my Patreon page, which is linked for you in the description. Support me there for as little as a dollar or more a month. You'll also find a link in the description to the Hellfreezer Discord, as well as a Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring. And if you really enjoyed today's video, you can click on the heart underneath the video with a dollar sign in it, and leave the tip of your choice. That is not required, but I do very much appreciate it. Okay, no other bits and pieces today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... If you find an item of clothing no longer fits you anymore, too tight, too loose, whatever, do you put it aside thinking, well, it'll fit me again one day, or do you give it away? Or even throw it out if you think it's not in good enough condition? Uh, I generally will put it aside. Like I've got some t-shirts that are starting to fit me again because they didn't for a bit because I was much too fat. Uh, and I've lost a bit of weight and I'm making efforts to lose more and they're starting to fit me again. I've even got a couple of pairs of jeans that are getting to that point, which is very encouraging. So why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this came from Idiots in the Wild 168 and the question was, would you want to live in Hollywood? And today's answer comes from Griffin Ice Dancer. No way, no how. California is the land of the crazies. I've heard nothing positive from there in years. I'll stick to Florida, thank you. And I've been on the internet too long because I don't know if that last part was a joke. Thank you very much for your answer, Griffin Ice Dancer. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>